House floor, I think we are probably going to have a long day. Uh, first, we have the jobless jobs bill, and then we have a state government finance bill that doesn't fund state government. Uh, it's unfortunate that the jobs bill not only has no jobs, but it would roll back Minnesota's clean energy progress and the incredible economic growth and job creation that that has caused in the state. You know, still to this date, we've seen no bonding proposal either. So we have a jobless job bill and a complete zero on bonding. And, and those are the bills that should move Minnesotans' economic lives forward in the state. And we've just seen really an absence of effort by Republicans. And the choices Republicans have made at a time of budget surplus are just plain wrong. They've given millions of dollars to insurance companies. They've given millions of dollars in tax cuts to the super rich in corporations, and they have left behind Minnesota school children, uh, communities that need job growth, and really the state as a whole. Also at a time when we should be working together, uh, we have a, an atmosphere of, of really complete partisanship, and, and not even the respect to listen to people with different points of view. So at this point, I'll turn it over to Representative Mahoney, who will talk about the jobless jobs bill. Well, the jobless jobs bill, my question is, how much time do you have? It could, I, you know, I've got an hour-long speech, you know, but I, I probably shouldn't use it on the floor. Um, Rep Representative Garofalo and the Republican caucus has really not listened to the economic, the economists of the, of the world. We are eight years into a recovery, and we probably have our next dip sooner than, uh, than rather than later. Greater Minnesota has broadband issues. Rep Representative Garofalo has been the Pied Piper of, uh, of satellite dishes and satellite internet connections. He says, up front, $7 million is too much, is $7 million too much for broadband. And he has convinced his Republican colleagues that that's the correct way to go. We have had no uh, committee hearings or anything in this bill about how do we develop the next workforce. What do we need in the next five years, 10 years, 20 years? There has been no discussion about that. And he blames the sped up, um, uh, the sped up scheduling. It's it's just a false narrative there. In his bill, it's all the, you know, there are big things in his bill that he does, but it's the small things that really, really hurt. He's closing all the trade offices across the nation, across the world. Understand that in Minnesota, 200 jobs are connected to, 200,000 jobs are connected to trade in the state of Minnesota, whether it's manufacturing, ag, medical devices, in intellectual properties, and that's all exported. Those are, that's 200,000 jobs in the state of Minnesota. $20 billion worth of trade, and he's closing the, the trade offices. That's a small item, but it's not a small item if you're one of those 200,000 people whose job is going to go away. Um, his housing, he turns housing on its head. We have a program that serves 95% of workforce housing needs of this state. And he changes it in to a market rate housing, which serves about 10% of this state. And then he cryptically in ways and means says, well, if, if the housing finance agency does what I say, no written instructions, I'll fund you next year. Um, I've had better promises from, oh, never mind. <laughs> never mind. Um, and then, the small ones, and I can go into the Job Creation Fund and the Minnesota Investment Fund, but 40,000 people in this state every year get their wages stolen from them by the very, very few bad employers. And Representative Garofalo had multiple bills in front of him. He did not hear one of them. How to increase the penalties, make it easier for the departments to go after those particular people, and easier for the department to get workers' money back. And I don't understand. Both Republicans and Democrats believe if you've worked for eight hours, you should get paid for eight hours. And now I'll get into the MIF funds and the job creation funds. 
Minnesota Investment Fund, Minnesota Job Creation Fund are two of the most successful programs, and approximately 80, 65% of it goes to Greater Minnesota. He cut the funds in the Job Creation Fund, which you go to every, every economic development authority in the state, and they say that is the best program we have. It incentivizes, it's got good clawbacks, it's got good targets, and good um, accountability. It takes that small employer from 5 or 10 to 20 or 25. And I don't know any, I don't know any city, any small town in the state of Minnesota that wouldn't be very happy to have five more or 25 more jobs in their particular city or town. But apparently, the Republicans, when they vote for this bill, don't think that's an important piece. And then, the, job, uh, the Minnesota Investment Fund, the governor asked for, in, in total for both of these programs, $55 million. This bill today funds $30 million over two years. The Minnesota Investment Fund is a fund that we use as uh, grants, forgivable loans, to help businesses go forward. We're using it this year, and I think this is a great idea, great for Thief River Falls. The $4 million of it is already spoken for to help DigiKey um, expand up in Thief River Falls. So when you take that all away, and all in its, in its entirety, it's, the, it's, the, it's a jobless jobs bill by cut of a thousand cuts. And Representative Garofalo's bill, as written, well, I hope it doesn't get to the governor's desk, but if it does, my advice after 20 years of doing economic development is to tell the governor to send it back to the, uh, to the committees. So I'll, with that, I'll, I'll, I could say more about energy, but I'll let that up to Jean, uh, Regine, Representative Wiginius. Thank you. I'm going to talk about the energy portion of the bill, which is a smaller portion of the bill, but <laughs> equally powerful in cutting jobs. Basically, what uh, Representative Garofalo and the Republicans are doing are sabotaging solar, the new solar industry that we have in Minnesota. That's to the benefit of the fossil fuel industry, the Koch brothers and their friends. It is not to the benefit of Minnesotans. And let me tell you how that happens. Uh, first of all, we have a Made in Minnesota energy uh, solar program where uh, solar panels are made in Minnesota and there's a benefit for Minnesotans to acquiring those. Now, um, that's cut. It's gone. The Department of Commerce estimates that that's 495 jobs gone. The Renewable Energy Fund is gone. It is substituted, or there is a substitution and that is an energy fund, but that can't be spent on solar the way the rules are uh, proposed in this bill. So you can, one of the interesting things to think about for me, and I'm getting the final number this morning, but Minnesota uh, exports probably a billion dollars in dollars to other states not to Canada for uh, hydropower, but to other states to purchase uh, electric energy. To the extent we can keep some of those dollars in Minnesota with renewable energy, those dollars circulate in Minnesota, they make jobs in Minnesota, but we, what this bill does is say, keep those dollars flowing outside of this state to states uh, that have fossil fuels. Uh, so that's one of the big pieces of this bill. Another big piece of this bill is a real power grab uh, from the legislature uh, to the executive branch. And the power grab uh, is obviously in getting rid of the renewable energy um, uh, fund uh, and taking that money away. But the second thing would be the Volkswagen settlement. Uh, that money is money that could come to this state if the governor can certify that his designated agency, and that's the Pollution Control Agency, if that agency has the binding legal authority to spend the money. But what this bill says is no, the legislature has the final say 
on spending the money. I, I cannot see the governor signing a bill with that language in it because it takes away his power to certify to the trustee that he has the right to spend the money, which is what the trustee requires. Uh, the bill takes uh, from the uh, another power grab I would note is taking uh, away the governor's authority to uh, choose all the PUC, Public Utilities East Commission members, and having four of the five members chosen by the legislature. So that's another piece of the bill. Uh, one other that I'd like to mention is taking away citizens' rights. Citizens have right now to know if a large energy facility is coming into their neighborhood. That's done in the certificate of need. So if you take away the citizens' rights to know what's going to happen in their neighborhood and take away their right uh, to comment or, or ask questions about that project that's coming in. So that's done in the bill by uh, saying that large energy facilities, including pipelines, wind farms, and solar farms, uh, don't have to get a certificate of need anymore. So that's a, another big section of this bill. But for you all, watch uh, an amendment coming uh, that we have seen posted that uh, Representative Garofalo has that uh, tells Enbridge, uh, you know how politically uh, tough that one is right now. The Enbridge pipeline is going through a, lot, a process to see where they're going to be routed and what's going to happen to the uh, environment as it is routed. But Garofalo's bill said, Enbridge, go ahead. Do exactly what you want. You can do it now. That's clearly unconstitutional. Our Constitution specifically prohibits uh, us from giving a company a special benefit like that. So with that, I think we're probably ready to take questions. Only one thing I would add to my energy leads um, discussion is that we send 15 to 17 billion a year outside of the state of Minnesota. And that's just uh, a number we could quickly verify with Excel. I'm sure it's higher than that. But when I was the energy chair in 13 and 14, it was 15 to 17 billion a year we send out of the state. When we have wind and solar, we keep that money in the state. Um, I don't know if, uh, Sheldon, if you would, are interested in talking a little bit about the state government finance bill briefly, if people have time for that. Yes, and actually, did you mention Boyd Law? I did not. Um, just want to address the issue of voice over internet protocol, which is a form of technology that uh, our phone systems are transitioning into. In this bill, there's language that says any phone service that uses internet protocol is no longer regulated by the uh, PUC, the Public Utilities Commission, or Department of Commerce. Um, this is a huge deal because it eliminates or removes about 30 major consumer protections that are in statute. Um, this would affect um, all the, the current cable phone services and uh, quite likely the, uh, the current um, incumbent telephone companies because they as well have IP components to their phone service. Um, this is a huge takeaway for consumers, and it's something that, in my opinion, should be uh, strongly challenged and opposed. So that's called voice over internet protocol. It's a little bit um, obtuse or obscure, obscure and technical, but generally the idea is that you don't regulate a phone service based on technology. You regulate it based on the service that's provided. That's been the case for the last 100 years in the state of Minnesota. That's been the case of these consumer protection for the last 100 years. Uh, so I want to make sure that remains the law of the land. And there's an attempt by uh, these major companies to change that by saying, if something is IP, internet protocol, and again, that's just a technology, if that's used by a phone service, they no longer have to follow these basic consumer protections. With respect to the state government finance bill, um, I would just say in sum that uh, it entails a, a major slashing and undisciplined, undisciplined approach to dealing with the uh, administrative agencies and state government agencies that oversee the state of Minnesota. It's, it does harm 
not only to the agencies themselves and, and to the uh, employees of those agencies, uh, but also to the citizens of Minnesota because we expect good services and we, have a, we are a well-run well state and uh, need to uh, continue that way. Uh, if you look at the bill, probably the biggest takeaway, or one of the biggest takeaways, there's, many, there's a lot of um, regressive and problematic policy in the bill as well, and the governor has made clear he doesn't want policy unrelated to the financing of the bill uh, in the omnibus bill, but there's plenty of it in there. But uh, in addition to that, uh, one of the big uh, huge problems with the bill is that there's no funding for cybersecurity. Although they provide lip service to the need for cybersecurity and they mandate, and this is a common theme throughout this bill, mandating things without the funding, they mandate uh, uh, cybersecurity uh, um, improvements. There's no funding that goes along with it. So Minnesota's citizens remain at risk for personal data and the businesses remain uh, at risk for cybercrime and cyber theft. That's a big problem. We knew it last biennium, and it remains to be the case this biennium, and Republicans have done nothing about it. Can I go to Representative Wardenius? Uh, would you, uh, we've seen in the House and the Senate uh, and the Republican sides the uh, chipping away at a lot of the solar uh, the funding, the solar programs. Where does this leave the solar industry in Minnesota uh, after this bill? Folks who <clears throat> install solar, the new this is a new industry in Minnesota. It was kick-started, really, by the Made in Minnesota and the Renewable Energy Fund. So if you take away Made in Minnesota, uh, the Department of Commerce has said 495 jobs, just gone. One of the things that the folks, uh, the solar installers said to us, that in three, four, five years, not too long, that solar will be cheaper than fossil fuels. And if they lose jobs in Minnesota right now, and that industry is gone, then in four or five years, other major industries from outside of Minnesota will come in. So we will lose that new industry we have, these new businesses that we have that have invested in Minnesota, uh, and we'll just be substituting for something later. Is that? Yeah, you believe that the industry will be gone, if, that this will kill the industry? It was the Department of Commerce that testified that 495 jobs will be gone. And those are the new installers, the new folks who are working in making uh, solar panels, but also installing. Can I get to what I have to because I will add? That there, you know, there's two components to the solar industry in Minnesota, really. There are the large installers that are complying, helping the utilities comply with the community solar statute and the solar energy standard. And there are the small residential installers. And really, it's the small residential installers yes. and homeowners who are at risk of losing this opportunity. You know, many homeowners want to have the opportunity to go to solar. And right now, they can do that and stimulate job growth in Minnesota. So that's the portion of the solar industry that's really at risk. I think uh, with the, there are other components of the bill that propose to roll back the renewable energy standard, uh, but I think that the, um, the more serious risk in the bill is to the residential installers and homeowners in Minnesota who would like to put panels on their house. Why are we chipping away at this? I'm this sorry? Why, why are we seeing this chipping away at the industry? Your guess well, is as good as mine. Well, I'm going to give you, I'm going to tell you who wins and that is the Koch brothers in the fossil fuel industry. They're terrified of solar. They're terrified that solar becomes like wind. Wind has become cheaper than fossil fuels. It looks like solar is on that same track, and in four or five years, that will be there. So to the any way you can sabotage solar right now, you're holding back, uh, you're exporting Minnesota dollars to the states that have fossil fuels. I have a question about cyber, if I could uh, ask. Uh, um, tell me where I'm, I'm, I'm uh, ignorant on this, uh, where, where it's been going in the House. But have, do you guys intend to vote on the, the uh, congressional bill that just passed in the U.S. Congress on um, the, to ban Internet user browsing data, the collection of that? 
Yes. Is that, is that in the jobs bill? It's in the jobs bill, actually. Representative Mahoney probably won't. Are you going is, is, to, is that in the bill? Um, yes, it is. Um, it, it was a, Representative Thiessen put an amendment on in committee. I think he's got a couple more amendments today. Um, that is really an important piece, but there's so many other bad things in this bill. It's kind of a Sophie's choice, so to speak. Uh, this is a, it's a great idea to, to lay down that marker for all of these uh, large internet providers to say that you can't sell my, where I've been uh, on the internet. Uh, and he includes a variety of different sources, uh, internet providers, and um, will be the only state with that in the bill uh, or any in law, and I hope that gets through uh, conference, well, I know it'll get through conference committee because it's a really good idea. Uh, we need to send that message to the feds that they need to roll back that particular idiotic invasion of privacy, and I think this is a good start, and we'll be voting, I hope a lot of people vote no because I, this jobs bill, energy bill, does horrible things. Um, it even gets rid of the first-time homebuyer's assistance. Uh, but when it comes back from conference, we'll have this in it, and we'll probably all vote for that. How do you feel about the DigiKey benefits? Do you, do you support that? Or? I actually support that. I think it's a great idea. Uh, Thief River Falls is a, is a bustling, growing community. Um, we have made, I always say, how soon, how much are we investing, and how soon from the income generated by that job, or is it before we as a state get our investment back? The DigiKey really meets that standard and meets it very well. We'll within years we will have that um, those small dollars that we're putting into it. I can't remember the exact number of what we're investing, uh, but we'll get that back in taxes and income tax and sales tax and, and other things relatively quickly. That's a great idea. But do you hard to vote against this bill? Pardon? Is it going to be hard to vote against this bill with that kind of stuff in it? Okay. It, it ruins the economy for other parts of the state to the betterment of one, which I think is a great idea. It, um, it doesn't look to the future. It has no vision. It's got horrible energy policy. Do you have another half an hour? Um, but you had another question. I'm sorry. Well, I was just going to say, do, do you... Do you have any discomfort in favoring this single project while getting rid of these or cutting these programs that could benefit more? Or, or, or would you rather see DigiKey compete for these other resources within any other uh, company? We have a billion and a half dollar uh, surplus. It is, un it, it is foolish to not do DigiKey and fully fund these other programs, whether they're in uh, the, MIF, the Job Creation Fund, the Minnesota Investment Fund, uh, uh, any of the small business help that we do. And we as a state make investments pretty regularly. Uh, the shrimp farm is one that we make as a, that what was in the bill, it's now out as an investment. We've done riskier, but apparently they don't want to you know, help Greater Minnesota, Southwestern Minnesota, or Marshall and Benson and all the other places, so, or afraid to do it. Um, anyhow, I, I'm, I'm very comfortable with most of those. Most of those turn out pretty well. You only hear about the ones that didn't, like chopstick factories. <laughs> Leader Hartman, uh, one question about another subject. We're hearing all around the country uh, about your comments uh, regarding Cardgate. I'm wondering what the uh, fallout is here. Uh, are you, are you, um, any reaction to what you've been hearing from other members and from people around the country? I've been uh, getting overwhelming support for what I said. Um, yes. Strong support from my caucus. Um, and my wife. Um, <laughs> and all the white men in my family. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I think it speaks to a larger issue of tone in the Minnesota House this year. And really, leadership starts at the top. And from the installation of a mute button to the kind of conduct that happens in the retiring room, which is really a new phenomenon, the level of, of complete inattention to floor activity, uh, the speaker's long absences from presiding or even being present on the floor, 
Uh, there has never been a tone in the Minnesota House during my time here where dissent has been so thoroughly disregarded that people feel that they don't even need to listen to it. And I think that's, that's problematic. Uh, in a time when our country voted for Donald Trump, I think what people were saying is we'd really like uh, public servants to work together, to listen to each other, to find compromise. And so, um, you know, I have some work to do because the way in which I tried to get my colleagues to listen to some of my other colleagues um, in some ways has made the gulf a little bit deeper. And so I have some work to do because I think there's, there's two important roles I have to fulfill. One is to stand up for people whose voices aren't being heard. But another one is to try to bridge that divide with Republicans. And I've already had a good conversation with uh, Representative Davids and Representative Detmer. And I said, it's probably too soon for me to invite you to my house for a game of Texas Hold'em. Um, although Davids thought that was a pretty good idea. Um, but we need to do some work uh, with each other to listen to each other and respect each other. I think that's part of what we need to do, too. You know, earlier this week, I definitely did part of my job, which is calling attention to people who aren't being heard. But I will continue to work on the other part of my job, which is to reach across party lines and develop those relationships that can lead to productive policymaking. Is there a little bit of regret in there, in your answer? Well, I, I regret the extent to which relationships have been damaged, yes, for sure. Because I, I respect my Republican colleagues. I know that everybody who runs for office in the state of Minnesota does so because they want to make Minnesota a better place. And I want them to understand that I respect their point of view, and I listen to it, and I, le I learn from Republicans. I mean, the, one of the things about that debate that was so incredible is I was learning from everybody who was speaking. It was really a phenomenal debate. Well, in, in, along those lines, uh, the, this is about what the speeches were about. This is about what the topic was about. Uh, there were some very emotional uh, addresses from women of color, and that's one of the things you were concerned about. The identity and gender of the people who were speaking was relevant, and the identity and gender of the people who weren't listening was relevant. Um, but we really have got some work to do uh, together. And really, I, I'll just say it again, I think leadership starts from the top. And I had a conversation with um, Speaker Doubt and Majority Leader Pepin, um, I think it was yesterday, about that we all need to work together on this. This isn't something that I can do as the minority leader. The speaker has to convey uh, respect for dissenting points of view. And basic civility, whether it's on the House floor or um, in our negotiations with the governor or with the Senate, we, we have to get to a point where we can talk to each other and we can listen to each other. What else goes on? Did you get any assurances or, or pledges of, of cooperation? Or? Um, I wouldn't say that, no. What else goes on in there? A lot of eating. A lot of eating. A lot of coffee consumption. So, you should probably go to the floor unless there's any last. Yes.